Welcome to 90 Minutes with Neville Southall. I'm your co-host, James Rogers. I'm here with the big man himself, Neville Southall. Hello, Nev, how are you doing? Very well, James, thank you. We've got uh, Dave Feely from our podcast team. Hi, Dave, how are you? Hi, hi, Ken. And we've got a really great guest today. We're absolutely honoured to have director Ken Loach join us. So, Ken, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Welcome, welcome aboard. Uh, it's a real pri privilege um, to, to meet you all and... Uh, Say hello to you. Brilliant. Brilliant. We, you know, I was lucky enough to see your latest film, The Old Oak, um, just a few weeks ago. I mean, do you want to, given the fact that that's your latest in an absolutely gigantic body of work, do you want to kind of tell us a little bit about what, what brought you to that topic specifically and how that film came about? Um, well, um, we, we've done three films uh, in, in the Northeast uh, reflecting different sides of um, d different stories within with, within society. I mean, they're, they they apply throughout our country, but um, we wanted to link them through place because the northeast is particularly um, having particularly a hard time. And the the, the first one was about uh, people who are due their social security payments, but the state makes it very hard for them to to claim. Uh, the second one is uh, the 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 gig economy we have no job security no fixed income um and the struggles to for family life and who pays the price in that for those conditions and the third one is about a a, a community where the old industry is gone in this case the next mining community and the uh the refugees from the syrian war um, and it was in the northeast that one of the most deprived areas that had more refugees from Syria than any other part of the country per head of population. Bizarrely, and the least able to cope, you would think. No infrastructure, shops closed out of the pit closed, um, young ones often left, house prices fell, no work um, where you had to travel, uh, no infrastructure. Um, Community spaces closed down. A deprived, abandoned community with nothing. And uh, into that comes another community with nothing, except what they brought in a bag, and the trauma of war. And the question is, will they, will they find a way to, to live together and support each other? Or will the racism that is now emerging and being promoted by the right wing by politicians, will that cause the split to get even worse? Or will the, the old memory of solidarity of the miners, will that will that win the day? And that, that's the question. Which will win? And and it's touch and go throughout the film. I can here's a few um questions from Owen. He absolutely loves you. He's in Warwick University studying films and stuff. The first question is, how do you go about incorporating sensitive social issues into filmmaking and where is the balance between storytelling and advocacy? Well, th that's a good question. But I think I think that the point is that the two are totally linked. Um, and it starts from a political point of view, I guess. And that is that society is riven by class conflict, by conflict of interests. Those who sell their labour and those who exploit it and benefit from it. And that's that's a conflict that is irreconcilable. And it'll it'll only be it'll only end when we have a, a new and a restructured and a better way of living together. The next question is who will who will who can who who will bring that change? And now it's even more urgent because of the climate disaster we're all facing. Who will bring that restructuring? And I think, again, the political answer that we all learned in the 60s, going back a long way, uh, is that the working class is the only, is, is where change will come from. It won't come from on high, from people with privilege. It'll come from the people. Therefore, the, 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 the people you want to tell stories about, the people you want to celebrate, is us, really. It's the ordinary people. Um, and the... The, and to understand people's positions, the struggles they face, the choices they have, the pain they go through, the, the, the daily 
battle to survive often for, for the poorest. Um, the gains we've won, the victories we've won, the defeats we've had and what must we learn from them and so on and so on. Um, and the humour, you know, always the humour. There's always comedy. There's always a gag somewhere. And so to celebrate all that and to try to understand it and and support those who are who who are also in the struggle. So um so then the question is then what story do you find? And what I mean I've worked with this well I've worked with some brilliant writers, but for 30 years I've worked with Paul Laverty, a great writer. And I think well in a way we've almost come to define the right story. And it's maybe most of them have been contemporary stories. And you look for a story that is maybe a few people, a family, people at work, half a dozen people. There's a contradiction in their relationship. There's something a knot that needs to be untied. The story is the untying of the knot and the resolution and the catharsis at the end. But if you simply tell that story and you've got the right story, it will shine a light right to the heart of the way society is structured. So the, the stories you tell, if you've got the right ones, you don't need to make a speech. It's, mm -hmm. it's in the events of the story themselves. It's the understanding the choices people make and why they often make bad ones, it seems, and why they're in such a bad, tough position or why they, why they survive. And it's understanding that, that people can say, well, yeah, I get that. <laughs> I can see what they've been through, and it tells me something about my situation in an ideal world, you know. So those are the stories, that, and so they're embedded. The one is embedded in the other. Um, and if ever you have to make a speech to explain it, which, you know, sometimes we've done and failed, then you, you've got the wrong story. Right, so his next question, Owen's next question is, what are the current issues in UK politics that you feel need addressing, and how can cinema be used as a tool for that? Oh, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, well, we've done the. I mean, it's the one we've, we've tried to do because I, I don't think I've got any more left in the uh, locker now. I think, I think, it, you know, when you reach advanced age and um, I mean, it's a full, it, it, it's a tough, I don't want to make a meal of it, but it is quite a mm. tough job directing a film physically and mentally the concentration you need and if I did another one I'd be 90 by the time I finished it so I think yeah, <laughs> I, I, I I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm not sure I'd, I'd, I'd get through another one uh, but um, well I mean the rise in poverty mm. I mean we never thought there would be food banks I mean I, I'm a, I would remember I would, a war babe well born before the war I mean I mean I remember the bombing I remember the post-war period well, and it was it was rationing. Nobody went hungry. No. Everybody had a home. Everybody kept warm. There was food on the table. And yes, you know, we people felt they'd won the war together and they're gonna win the peace. So the idea that hunger is used as a discipline mm. for, to say, right, however vulnerable you are. However ill you think your, do your doctor says you are, you get out and you get that job and you'll get ripped off, but that's what you're going to do. And if you don't, you'll starve. And that's what the government is effectively saying because they know the food banks of it. They, they, know, they know the figures. Mm. And they know if you, if you cut off money to the most vulnerable people, they will starve. It's like I'm afraid what is happening in Gaza now. Mm. The people who have cut off their food and make it impossible for people to eat, they know they are inflicting starvation on, well, in that case, millions. Mm. And the crime that we're watching now, and in fact, I mean, you say which issues, I mean, if I, 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 the, the, that's a story that needs to be told, really, but but it doesn't start on October the 7th, as we know. Um, so the, that, that's one thing. I mean, a, another thing, I guess, is uh, the history of industrial struggle. And we're talking now of the miners' strike. And I, I did a documentary of the miners' strike in, when it was on, really. Uh, and it was banned. <laughs> it was banned by by ITV. It was it was it was a film called We Side One for the South Bank show. And I tried to get. I, I'd have done one about their allotments if 
because I was desperate <laughs> to do one, but I, I could the um tried everywhere to get the only one I could do was about the songs and poems because it was a, a creative explosion. And the um it, it, they were they were writing about police brutality. Um and uh, the people at ITV said, Oh sorry, we're not putting that on our screens. Uh, it was during the strike, it was it was August of, of 84. They wouldn't put that on the screens then. They will now, 40 years later, because it's of no account. But that's their trick. But the lesson of the minor strike is being missed by the, you know, the BBC and ITV, they're wallowing nostalgia. It's really about the determination of the Thatcher government to reduce the power of organised labour. Because in the 70s, it was the decade in which the highest proportion of, of gross national income or product, whatever it is, went to, to working class people. They were determined to change that. Therefore, you reduce the power of labour. Therefore, you, you make unions weaker. Therefore, you have legislation against them. Therefore, you allow mass unemployment to rise. Because if, if there's someone outside to do your job for half the money, hard to organise a union. Yeah, okay, so that was there. And, but the thing that nobody will say is that the other unions had been defeated by this time. They'd sold jobs. Union leaders, when, when, when workers were occupying factories, to say, no, we're keeping this factory open, it's viable. Union leaders were saying, get out. Union leaders were cooperating with the police to get them out. The collusion of union leaders is never told. And the collusion of people like Kinnock and Hattersley, who led the Labour Party, that's never told. They never went near a picket line. Never went near a picket line. And they blame Arthur Scargill. But that collusion with Thatcher is what enabled her to get it through. So that's the story. We, uh, I could go on. I could go on, Neville. <laughs> I could go on. Well, his next question is, how does it impact the filmmaking process using more non-professional actors? How does it impact the authenticity of social issues? Well, it's interesting now. I mean, the thing is, a camera is, is um, it's not like theatre acting. Film acting is, uh, in the theatre, you've got to have a, you, you learn the whole arc of the performance, the motive, what you do in this scene, the motive that leads you into that scene, and then that scene, and that scene, till you get to the end. And you, you have to know that because you've got to do it every night. Film acting, you need a moment of truth. And if you've got it on the right camera and you can get the right supporting shots around it, mm. one moment will tell you the truth. So it's a different kind of acting. And also a film camera can, can see the pores of your skin. It can see what you're thinking behind your eyes. It can see if, if you're a working class person or not, the way you hold a knife and fork, the way your body is, the texture of your skin. If you're... You can tell what kind of diet you're eating often. You just, just, you can tell what your hands are like. Oh, yeah. And it, it sees everything. So in a, in a sense, a film that's trying to be realistic can make it, is, is also a little documentary within it of the people in, in the film. And I mean, we've, we've found, I mean, I found quite early on that if you've got to be much tougher with, directors and, and writers and, and people can be much tougher with themselves than when they choose people. You've got to look at it and say, look, forget performance. If you saw that person on film, would you think they're an actor? Or would you think, yes, that's, that person is doing their job. They know how to do it. I mean, like in the last one, we just did the main part, the man who, who owns the pub, the old oak, which is on its last legs. I mean, he's, he's a fireman. Most of his life, he was a farmer. He worked for the FBU. He retired. He ran a pub for a time. So when he's running a pub, I mean, he's pulling a, a pipe without thinking about it, and he's talking and he's not thinking. He doesn't have to calculate anything. It's in his it's in his bones, and that applies whatever the job. And you can see it, and 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 it's a, that. So that's one thing. The other thing, it is surprising what people can do. People can say, "Oh, I couldn't act," but Put them in a situation, we, we do little improvisations to find people. Put them in a simple situation, domestic situation. I don't know, um, simple thing, you know. But 
you've got an unwelcome visitor at a wedding, you know, got to invite him. What are you going to do? I'll get pissed. Somebody thinks, oh, you've got to have him because he's a favoured. He's a favourite of the bride. And someone says, we can't because he made a scene last time. And you sort of work it out. It's just a simple scene. Or, or there's a dog crapping outside someone's door and, and the neighbour, <laughs> you've got to accost the number and tell him. And the neighbour says it's someone else's dog. Simple things, you know. Everyone can do it. Everyone can have that argument. And bit by bit, you take people through over a period of weeks. You take people through different levels of connection and emotional engagement until in the end, you know, people are in tears sometimes. But they say, well, I can't act. <laughs> but of course they can because <laughs> Because it's about vulnerability. Mm. It's about capacity to believe that what you're doing is really happening. Mm. And so people are more amazing, extraordinary, and, and brilliant. Um, mm. And uh, and and we always have one or two actors as well, you know, with experience because they through a process of osmosis they communicate some of the professionalism you need, you know. Um, and also you've got to handle the technology right, so nobody's nobody feels daunted by what's happening, and also people feel empowered. They're not going to be taken. Nobody's going to take the mickey out of them. They're going to be respected. They can't do anything wrong, you know. If they cock it up, it doesn't matter. It's any bit of film in the camera. They'll like, go again, stop and have a cup of tea. You know, so it's got to be warm, welcoming, friendly, mm. enjoyable. Yeah. And uh, there's always an answer, but enable people to... I, th I think in this respect, there must be a connection to to football, because to, to teamwork, really. Because yeah. if people... It's confidence, isn't it, Neville? I mean, if people are confident... And and know that everyone cares for them. They are free then to do their best. The moment I'm well, in my experience, I, I mean, I've been interested in the way you think about this. When people have been have been criticised, they feel they feel then. But most people, not all, most people will shrivel. Yeah. And then when we said that that's true, true for films, I think. I think with anything like a football club, you have to build an environment where people feel safe and can be themselves. And I think then there's two ways of handling criticism. You 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 can either, as a, as a club and as a team, you can either go to pieces or you can get a siege mentality where you go, right, fuck you, we're going to do it anyway. And you stick together and you get through it because you know and I know I suppose in front of the camera, behind the camera, on a pitch, you're going to make mistakes, and they're going to be seen by thousands of people, well, millions of times. So you have you have to be prepared to be brave enough to make mistakes and honest enough to make mistakes, but also you've got to you've also got to know that you're human, and you're going to make mistakes. So you can never be perfect. So it's about creating that environment where you can make a mistake, but we take it because you don't do it every week and you're human, but you you get that bond together where you've got a real strong bond and everyone sticks together. And I think, I'm not sure what it's like in filming, but on a good football club, you could tell by the car park because in the morning, the car park early is full because everybody wants to be there and they stay late. If you run a bad club, everybody wants to be there at the last minute and go home as soon as they possibly can. And so it, it does. You you can have a look. Have a look at Bath. When Bath are doing well, people will be there early. The crowd will be there early. You'll all be all that excited. When they're struggling, there's a negativity that comes with it. And then that's where you need your spirit. And that's where the spirit can only come from one place, and that's in people. It can't come from outside. It's got to come from the people itself. Yes. So I, yes. You look at the people all the time and go, right? Have we got the right characters in this in this place? And, yeah. and usually a good atmosphere you have characters yeah I, I think i think that's true and i think also i mean i find if you want to say something you want to nudge someone in a different direction you say it privately quietly and put it in such a way that the person themselves can say what they need to do you know rather yeah. than saying you ought to do i mean take you an obvious example from films if you want someone to um to break down or shed a tear and never put in the script 
so-and-so cries here or so-and-so she weeps because the moment that person reads that they're going to be scared that come the day cries i can't cry so you put them in a situation in which they are likely to grieve and if they do weep that's a bonus but but the moment you put that you issue that kind of command about what emotion you must display that emotion will shrivel because they're terrified they can't do it you know Let's and I think, I think i think nudging people and said so allowing people to find the answer you want mm. by um i mean i used to say that there's a directing actors is like um uh Allow finding a path for water to follow. I mean, put, put water at the top of a hill, it'll just run everywhere. Dig a trench, mm. pour the water, it'll run where you want it to. Mm. It's, not, it's not deciding I will walk, run down this path. It has to, because that, that's the obvious easy way. And I think that's, that's a bit like directing actors, like people in the film. You make it, you make it an easy path for people to take the decision to, to instinctively find that that is what they're doing. So next time you want someone to cry, I'll send you the DVD of Everton. <laughs> <laughs> Works for me every time, to be fair. <laughs> Only one last question I've got, right? And it might seem a bizarre question for, yeah. for you and for the other two, to be fair. Just yeah. Because the language is changing acting, right? I only like, you know, the old show comes film with Bather Rasbone and people like that, where you can use your imagination as well. It just, the language seems to change and everybody seems to want the films to be um, aggressive, powerful, I suppose. How many car crashes and how many explosions can you possibly have? But why don't they go back to just being the story instead of all the other stuff that goes with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I agree. I mean, that, that's what we try to do. I mean, the, um, yeah, it's not about, it isn't about that. The, the excitement comes from the, the connections people make. The excitement comes from getting drawn into mm. being absorbed by the people on, that you're watching, um, feeling solidarity with them, maybe, mm. um, caring for them. Um, it, it's it's being drawn into it, it and mm -hmm. and just a just a simple thing, you know, and um, it's, it's simple things, and and I mean, often the you know it used to be the case in classical drama. Often the the uh, big events happen off stage, you know, mm -hmm. um, and there's something in that because it means your imagination works and creates it, and you see the reaction and the response. Um, I mean, there's a death towards the end of the old oak, and it's um, it doesn't happen on screen. It's it's um, people hear of it, mm -hmm. um, and it, I mean because again, you know, just having a few or to twenty or thirty or so uh, Syrians in in the film, and they were all carrying huge trauma. I mean, in real life they were. I mean, these were the people who lived nearby. These were the real Syrians, and the main girl was from uh, the Golan Heights, which is. Now Syria occupied by Israel, but it's occupied Syria, um, and she won't have an Israeli passport. She says, "No, I'm, I'm from occupied Syria." Um, wonderful girl, brilliant, lovely, talented young woman. Um, she had huge respect, great for and great warmth she has. And so, um, a bit it, it it happens off off screen, but. In a way, I hope you care about it. Um, yeah. You care about it, um, and and I, I I agree. I films that just will well, it's just it's like a circus, isn't it? You know, I mean, cinema. You know, it's, that's I guess one of the overriding traditions of cinema. It's like a circus. You know, it's like crash bang wallop, really. Um, and, um, it's not my kind of cinema. Yeah. No, no. So I'm gonna hopefully James or Dave will have a few questions now as well. Okay, okay. Hopefully, uh, have you? I'd love to ask you. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Ken. Sorry I was late. No. I'd like to say, just to start with, you're a hero to me personally, but also 
particularly to my generation, who I left school the same week that that year was elected. And I'm going to pick a couple of examples of your work. Obviously, Kez touched us all. We laughed, we cried while we were still in school. But more particularly, it was just to give you some context, within five years of leaving school, I was squatting in London in 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 a council block next to Millwall's ground. I was oh, right. working on the buildings, cash in hand. And I was also on heroin at the time. So I'm gonna I'm an ex, I've, I've sorted all that out years ago, but it it riffraff, particularly riffraff, was was like watching me and my friends. And there was people from Liverpool in, in, in prominent roles in that film. And also mm-hmm. Raining Stones, actually, as, as um, um, a, a, a dual piece. It was like Raining Stones was at home and Rip Rack was where we were now. And even when we got away from that, we went back to Raining Stones. I hope you, you see what I'm trying to portray with that. Mm-hmm. And it was, I, I can't, it was profound. It was the only time, still now, 40 years later, that I can honestly say that me and not just my immediate group of friends, everybody I knew, knew these pieces of work. And these were not cinema goers per se. You know, they wouldn't go and see Star Wars, for example, or, you know, like that. It was profound, the effect it had. Because like you, you, you were explaining before, about the Thatcherism, what came um, from 1979, 80 and onwards. This had been planned for a decade before. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was, it was a war of attrition, and it was yeah. just that finally someone on the TV. Channel Four was a big help, by the way. Channel Four coming along in '82, like it did, gave us a voice. It allowed a stage for that sort of art to be portrayed. But you were magnificent. I really do need to say that to you. Well, it, it's really kind of you. I mean, it was Channel 4 who, who banned four documentaries we did about the collusion of union leaders in 80, yeah. 83, just before the miners' strike happened. Um, they, they, they banned it. Um, so uh, I've mixed feelings about Channel 4. But they did yeah. do good stuff. And the Raining Stones, I think they were, they were involved in. But the, the, the point about... Uh, uh, Riff Raff was written by um, an ex a building worker, an ex seaman who was a building worker, um, lovely man who who died far too young, great sense of humour, um, and but uh, uh, Raining Stones and the Spanish Civil War film we did and um, Land of Freedom, the, uh, <laughs> Land of Freedom, and uh, we did a whole series with him called Days of Hope about the early labour movement. It was it Jim Allen? I mean, a Brit, you'd you'd have loved him. You'd all have loved him. He was a he was a, a Manchester man um, uh, uh, from uh, from inner Manchester. That as when the the poor housing was clearly moved out um, to Middleton, um, but um, he was uh, from an Irish background. He, he, he said to be proud. He was from the Bog of Allen, and. Uh, and was hilarious. He'd been a building worker. He was a dock worker, um, and he'd been a miner. Uh, and and what was great about him he was he began as a he was a political activist, and he would get a job as a building worker, and on the site, and he'd get people to join a union. He'd form a union branch. The boss would say, "Right, you, I know where you're up to, out," and he'd get booted. He'd go to another site and form another union branch. I mean, he was—he was a wonderful man. Um, not that he was great on structure, but his his dialogue was muscular. He could write dialogue of men at work like no one else, and um, great fun. I mean, he was—he used to get oh, so many stories about Jim. I mean, he was ten years older than me, and uh, he—he—he um, uh, he got his he got his clothes from. Um, uh, from the local pub, where the the the, the local low level villains uh, would take orders for what he wanted, and then mysteriously they would arrive sometime later when they managed yeah. the right 
<laughs> Nobody asked where they come from. They just appeared. And um, we were going to, we went to Cannes once, and went once, and the, uh, we, we, the, I forget which film it was, but it was, I think it was Land of Freedom. Um, anyway, I said, Jim, you've got to come, you know, because he will say, no, I can't come. I don't intend to live with that. And he always took the piss out of me. He always thought, like, you know, because I've been to university, it was always, yeah, yeah. ah, yes, stuff, something and all that. Yeah. Anyway, I said, Jim, you've got to come. But look, you've got to wear, you've got to wear a dicky bow and, um, and a, a black dinner jacket and that. He said, oh, okay now. And so, anyway, he placed the order in um, and he, he placed the order for the jacket, which was fine. But the um, the trousers, um, obviously, um, the gym is a bit skinny. Like I mean, his trousers were the waist was right, but they they'd be made for a man, you know, about uh, three or four inches shorter than Jim was. So they came halfway up his legs, and what of course he'd forgotten to get were black shoes. So he came up in the scabbiest pair of old trainers, um, <laughs> up this red carpet. And uh, he was, I would touch and go whether they were going to let him in. But anyway, the, you know, he was with us on that day. But I mean, it was the scabbiest outfit you'd ever seen. And he always had a carrier bag with him. You know, he said, oh, don't want to break. He said, he'd have a carrier bag. He'd, 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 he'd carry his carrier, supermarket carrier bag with him wherever he went. Um, hilarious, man. And he'd get some. Um, I used to go and see him in Middleton and when we were working on the script. And if, if we if we had a, a point where he thought one thing and I thought another, um, just to test my uh, working class credentials, um, he'd take his teeth out and place them on the table so, and, uh, and, and, and challenge me to comment on them. <laughs> and uh, I said, put the bugger away. Jim, for Christ's sake, and uh, he'd sit, he'd sit there um, massacring a sandwich while we had a snack. Anyway, he was a but what a what a writer, wonderful, wonderful writer. He had a row of books. I've got a few books here, but I mean, he got um, he got a row of books in his house, um, and I mean, he filled a wall, filled two walls in in, his, in a room with books, and he'd read them all. I mean, I've I've read most of these, but I mean, Jim had really read them. And um, I mean, I'd say I've been a university, been lucky past the 11 plus and got to university. Um, I mean, G Jim was self-taught, but my God, he could, he could catch you out on anything to do with left politics, the great socialist classics. Um, I mean, he was a, a, one, one of the generation that, that really were self-taught. Um, and I think now, sadly, a lot of the kids who would have followed that that pattern are now, um, you know, they didn't study media at university, which won't do them half as good in terms of class consciousness as it would do working on the building site as you did. Um, and not saying that, you know, don't to decry education, of course not. I mean, education's vital, important, but, but, that, but it, it's changed the dynamic it's how militants have come through. Sorry. No, I, I was trying to uh, 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 supplement your point. The didactic thing where we weren't. I ended up going to university in in my early 30s. Uh, once I come back from London, but it wasn't a, I was, I would have, if I'd left school, I left school with enough qualifications today, if it had been the route today, I'd have probably gone that route anyway. But it wasn't an avenue open for us. So the didactic, self-taught often from your parents or your grandparents or your greater family and, and your extended family if that was your sort of an inner vocation that's where you found it you didn't find it from the system because it wasn't available through the system you could find ways through it it began to change in the early 90s and stuff mm -hmm. but those people examples like jim just been talking about yeah they're yeah. the people who can just, uh, it's just coming to me. I was on the top. Jimmy Mums, I know you're 87. My mum's 85. Yeah. And I went for a coffee with her this morning. And I said, she knows that you're a hero of mine. My mum's me, and she's gone through my life with me. And she said, you make sure you tell him today that she saw something last week or the week before of Ricky Tomlinson, who, again, is didactic, is self-taught and yeah. motivated in yeah. all of the fields you've just been describing. Yeah. I just saw a programme with him 
last week or the week before where he said, keep your Steven Spielberg. Keep all of them. Ken Loach is the man for me because nobody ever cared for the underclass, never mind the working class, the underclass like this man and had so much eloquence and insight and that's a fabulous tribute. It's also true, incidentally, but coming from my mum to impress upon me the importance of we're severely limited with time here today, but I had to do it because she will watch this back and say, you never said about the thing and it's you write what you say about about characters like Jim. Mm -hmm. They they got us through that era because we weren't equipped. We didn't we are now, we're older. We've got kids yeah. and grandkids and whatnot. And you yeah. and you get that life experience. But without those characters going round the building sites mm -hmm. and organizing um unions and, and and group thought, it was it, it was invaluable. Absolutely invaluable. Yeah. Yeah. And before I pass over to James for to ask yeah. his question, I'm going to show you one thing. I hope you can see this. Yeah. Can you see what that says there? Oh, God, my eyesight's crap. It says, Sack um, Catholic, keep young. <laughs> the golden vision. Yes. We, yeah. as a football club, are in yours and Gordon Honeycomb. Yeah, Alex Young signed this, by the way. Right. So, uh, it was it was an absolute standard of my life, and we are eternally grateful. Yeah, and the song, what they sing as they're walking down the street, that's now come back, and the kids right. sing it in the ground today. Right, and you gave um, them that. You yeah. did that. That the okay. Goodison Gang song, marching down the Goodison Road. That's yeah, yeah. you. You did well, that. So we thank you. Well, look, I have to I have to say something about that because it was written by uh, another Neville, uh, Neville Smith, uh, who was a, a, a great Everton fan. And it's Neville's film, really, it's Neville's film. I mean, obviously, he, um, I mean, he, he was the inspiration for it. He wrote it, the characters are his. Um, and um, I mean, I was pleased to be able to direct it, but uh, it was uh, it was um, a, a, a great idea, and um, I've got to mention Neville Smith because he's uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, he, absolutely. He, he's the man who should be remembered for for the Golden okay. Vision. But it was it was an amazing film to do. I mean, it was huge fun because for the first time we worked with a lot of Liverpool comics at the time that the working men's clubs were in their heyday. Um, and the great Billy Dean and Jerry Kay and the oh, whole. Ken Jones, yeah, yes, Ken yeah, Jones. yes, yes. Ken, Ken James was the main man, but he was more. I mean, he was a, a regular actor. The, the others were comics, but we we we'd laugh from eight in the morning till seven at night because it, it became it became a competition telling gags. Really, I mean, it, it was hilarious. It was hilarious. Um, and uh, I, I, we we did other films in Liverpool, but um, and I, I got a nickname. And um, they, they kept saying, here he is, Dick Turpin again. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, after a bit, I said, well, what's all this, Dick Turpin? And uh, and they used to sit in the bus, you know, everybody ride about the bus. And they said, well, um, every, every now and then, when we're sitting in the bus, you'll come in and break your head through the door and say, uh, sorry, lads, the, 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 there's been a holdup. And so <laughs> after that, here's here Dick Turpin. <laughs> Dick Turpin. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're great days, really. But, but uh, it was uh, certainly Neville Smith's golden vision. Well, thank you, anyway. Go on, James. So, Ken, so Ken I was going to ask, um, you know, let's say 50 or 100 years from now, when people are looking at your this body of work, which spans, you know, so many decades and so much in British life, um, so many aspects of British life. How do you want your work to be remembered? And you know, and you know, I'm confident people will be studying your body of work in fifty or hundred years. How do you want it to be remembered? How do you think it will be perceived? Um, well, I, I mean, I have to, the first one I have to make is I always work with writers. The film belong to the writers as well as me. You know, and I've worked with Paul Laverty for thirty years. I'm a wonderful writer, wonderful, wonderful writer. 
a great insight, huge, I mean, politically committed to these bones, like Jim was, like Barry Hines was, who wrote Kess. And, you know, I can never talk about my films. I mean, they're always ours. So it's really important. And there's, as uh, Neville knows, there's no I in the team, you know, and it's, they're not empty words that, I mean, it's the truth. Um, and I hope, I hope, um, I don't know, what would you like? I mean, the best you could hope for is he put in a shift, I think that, that'll do. Um, and you you kind of start with, I well, we learned our I, politics and our basic ideas in the 60s um, with uh, the, you know, when we were beginning um, and, um, and just tried to, as I said, really from films like Cathy Come Home onwards, just realised these were the stories to tell and tried to pick up ways of doing it, um, tried to pick up to be your harshest critic, so you'd look at what you tried to do and say, now that is it, are we, are we kidding ourselves? Is this, is this a film judgment or is it a real life judgment? You know, you've always got to go back to it as a real life judgment. You know, if I saw these people walking down the street, would I say, yes, yes, he is, he is the part, he's, he's meant to be in the film. And to find ways of doing that. Um, and, and then, you would hope that people would say, well, yeah, well, okay, we can we can believe that's how life was. And we can believe that's the struggles people had. Um, and reflect on what's, what's gone on in between. Um, things might have changed, or we might still be facing the same sort of catastrophes. But I have a feeling, I have a feeling in, um, in, in, in 50 to 100 years time, things will have either changed drastically or, or, or it will be, have been a catastrophe, simply because the, the, the environment is, is collapsing around us, as we know, and there will be mass migration. What we see now in terms of migration will have been mass migration. Um, so I, I think we're on the edge of a precipice, to be honest. Um, and if, um, if it would be great to think, well, people have seen the work they've tried to do, and you know, it's it's a it complements what we our experiences, such as they are, um, and gives a clue as to why we've ended up where we are. Um, but I think that's about as far as you can get, really. When you started filmmaking, and obviously there was a Britain that you were making the first films and documentaries, and indeed. You know, and your, your, your dramatic work as well. Um, you know, work in the theatre. Did you, you know, as we here we are now in twenty twenty four? Does Britain look like how you imagined it would when you were kind of looking ahead from the nineteen sixties? Is there anything that's surprised you in terms of you know either positively or negatively about where we're at now? I think uh, there's a huge difference. I mean, what you couldn't, what well, we could never foresee was the, the digital world. You know where um, just just the um, just the realities of daily life have changed. You know, you think newspapers are going to be with you forever. You, you think um, just the you think the milk was going to come every day. You think the postman was going to come every day. Um, there, there were no. I mean, the idea that there weren't there were. And when you walk down the street, you don't see a baker's and a chem and the chemist in a you know, I've been a butcher and a greengrocer and an ironmonger and all those basic things that, you know, the first, well, the first half of my life, really. And the idea of a, a, a phone that you walked around with, you know, we had, a, we had a telephone in the hallway and it was so cold. You know, only it was cold because there was no central heating, obviously. So um, there were very short phone calls and, and the door was always open so your mother could hear who you were talking to. And um, and the old man would say, "How long have you been on that phone?" Because obviously, <laughs> worried about the bill. <laughs> so, so you, phone calls were very short. I mean, we talked. You know, people talked. People met. People made arrangements. Most of, the, probably half the film I've done have been done without mobile phones, and you just make arrangements and have to stick to them. So it's um, I think the 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 the, the, the those changes are are um, those changes are um, inevitable. What isn't it? What 
uh, 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 unimaginable. You know, you couldn't foresee that. Or like we, we could, but I think what what is we could have foreseen again when we were thinking about this in the sixties was that the Labour Party was a right wing pro business party, and workers' interests were second. Um, because obviously we knew the story of the general strike in 1926, which is very, you know, the absolute parallel of the miners' strike. And there the Labour Party leader, Ramsay MacDonald, walked away from the strike, just like Kinnock and Hattersley did. And the other union leaders did this sort of nominal support for a week and then said, sorry, lads, you're on your own, and called it off. And so that's inbuilt collaboration with those in power we knew we knew that that was that was that and that has just been the same ever since i mean you don't think you're going to end up with such an unprincipled man as starmer who who cannot cannot share the common humanity to say stop sending weapons for these massacres to continue and he can't say, stop the killing in God's name, stop. He can't say it. It's, it's inconceivable a man can lead the labor movement with such lack of human decency when we see what we see night after night. I mean, that, that I mean, even, you know, even, even people from the left couldn't, well, I'm not, I couldn't see that. That, that that betrayal so being so intense um and i think there's a huge political vacuum now there's always been a political vacuum on the left but it's now so transparent i mean when when sunak and starmer you can't put a cigarette paper between them and yet there's this great demand for social justice and peace and human rights and just living together in decency in you know, a common decency anyway um so, but I think I think the betrayals of the Labour Party. I know we we, we knew that, that that was clear then. The the scientific and technical changes, of course, particularly the digital, we could never see. We could never see the the climate change disaster coming. I mean, back in the day, you used to think, well, if we don't win this battle, there'll be another one ten years time. But they won't now. And that that's what terrifies you when you get old, I think. You know, you look at your grandkids and think, my God, what world are we leaving them? So I mean if I think the motivation to, to dig into politics is it doesn't go away. You know, once you once you're bitten with the bug, you, you can't walk away from it. You can't walk away from I'd love to. I'd love to just go to the game, watch the cricket in the sun, listen to Gary Lineker Saturday nights and and um, and but it's um you can't you can't can you you can't there, there was a an old writer in the 30s called edward upward wrote a book a novel it was called no home but the struggle and i think when the when the once once you've clocked once once you've clocked what's going on you can't leave it you know no home but the struggle this is this, this is my final question, um, and I know that you you've probably been asked this before. But is there anything that could compel you to um, to do more work? Is there anything that could bring you back into either the filmmaking, documentary making, theatre world? Is there you know you've touched on climate quite a lot today? I mean, could we see something from you along those lines? Uh, I'd need I need a I'd, I need a transfer of monkey glands really. Um, I, I'd need I need decent eyesight, which is um, not very good now. Um, I mean, you only need one eye to look through a camera, but it's um, I mean it's it's not it's not in good shape. I, I the, the the problem is the um, you're away from home a long time. I mean, when when the the last three films in the northeast. Effectively, I mean, not in obviously in one straight, but if, over a period of two years, sometimes three years with the last one, um, and it's all the time I was away, probably away 14, 15 months. 
and it, it's a lot, you know, when it's just me and the missus. It's a it's a lot. It's a lot of time to be away from someone, you know, when you're really knocking on. So I, I, I don't think I could do anything. I couldn't do it for. I mean, it, there's a maintaining an emotional commitment as well for twelve hours a day, um, and focus and concentration, and your facilities do go, you know, after time, can't escape it. Sad. So if if you know if you know the right transplant people, I'll I'll know. <laughs> Glad to have a transplant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, I was going to ask Neville something if if you're still with us, Neville. Um, yeah. did, 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 did you overlap with the uh, with the great midfield trio at all? I couldn't remember exactly when you when you started at Everton. Well, Howard, Kendall, and Colin Harvey were obviously manager and coach. Colin became manager as well. Right, right. But right. you could you could see the discipline, the will to win, the class. Yes. If if I could put one person up as an Everton player for the future blueprint, it would be Colin Harvey. Yes, a, yes. He would never want to lose. He always yeah. wants to work hard. He always wants to learn. And and I think that worked against him as a manager because he couldn't get what he wanted and it drove him into the ground. But mm. as a player, it drove him forward. And obviously the the trio were unbelievable. So mm. I played after them, but to have Howard and Colin around was just just brilliant because there's something about when somebody you they walk to walk and they they be a pure class so you know whatever comes out you're going to learn something every single day with them and it, yeah. was, it was a pleasure going to work if you can call it work we did yeah. do twelve two at a stretch yeah yeah so I mean it was called cool. it was called cool cool the school cool. of science when when uh, it was the uh, uh, yeah. Was the uh, the phrase, wasn't it? The school of science. And Can I ask you a question? Actually, with context to Colin Harvey, his daughter works with us on this podcast. She's a oh, colleague God. of ours. And actually, five minutes before we came on air, she texted to the WhatsApp group. She's the only female in our in our collective here, and she asked me to ask you. Colin's daughter Melanie said, "Can you ask Ken?" Who, in his opinion, is the strongest female character in 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 his body of work? I know that's difficult because you've had really strong female characters. Well, could you yeah. pick one, maybe? Well, I mean, the one that stands out. I, spe- I mean, they're all they're all wonderful, and they're all like your children. So you you can't have favourites, you know. Yeah. But the, the the one woman who was utterly amazed. Well, they're all amazing. You know, they're all lovely stay in touch with with many and they're, they're all good pals and we all finish on you know with great friendship with everyone and the you know great friends um but um one who was extraordinary was chrissy rock and uh it was we did a film called ladybird ladybird yeah and um she, she, she's from liverpool as well as you know and um she 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 did we met her when she was doing stand-up comedy and we met her through ricky tomlinson as well who who was uh, suggested several people, and they were all good, but but Chrissy was exceptional, and um, she's there's something of a I don't know she reminds me of Edith Piaf, you know the little yeah, yeah. singer of the French. So there's something yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely true and authentic, but with a fighting spirit and a smile on her face, and you could never unvanquishable really. I mean, brilliant, and and she. She's had a, I mean, it's a story of um, a, a young woman who is abused as a child, who is um, caught in an abusive relationship, who has ch- four children through some with different men, and they're taken away by social security because of the abusive relationship she's in, and they don't think she's going to be a fit mother. And then she gets a good relationship, and it's a genuine man who is from Latin America actually and uh, genuine and and he cares for and and, uh, loves her uh, and they have a child. But the image he has with social security, with the the, the social care workers is so fixed that they don't see what has happened to change her 
potential. So they keep taking her children away. And her rage and her despair and her grief is so intense. Um, I mean, it's a performance I never, it was just overwhelmed us day after day. Um, and, um, and extraordinary. And she would let go and 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 she, obviously she I mean she indicated that that she knew what suffering was and um, uh, and and had I mean it, it touched it touched something very deep in her um, and I've uh, uh, the utmost respect for her. and and a, a brilliant woman um, and anyway we we were knocked out by. Her. Uh, performance and everyone was who was around the camera and everything um, and people when we were making it I mean people would I mean some of the crew were just weeping um, particularly at the end you know and there's it ends with a with just a moment of hope when the hands touching her hand and the, the hand of the guy she's with touch and it, it was interesting and it went to the Berlin Film Festival and um, she was and it was the old, you know, it, Berlin is is like like on a par with Venice and second to Cannes for international films. And uh, I mean, the, they're all like film stars alongside along in the other films. And Chrissy won Best Actress at the Berlin Film Festival. And what was absolutely unforgivable in our in our eyes, in my eyes, was that when it opened in in England, in Britain. Um, the film, the critics, the film industry took no notice of her whatsoever. Not a single mention in any of the, you know, the awful bloody awards things. Not a mention. And a lot of the reviews are, well, she's, this is, she's a world-class woman. This is who she is. She's not acting at all. And the vulnerability she displayed and the passion and the the kind of love and the grief and the depths of the emotion exchange that she and, and Vladimir Vega, who played opposite her, displayed were just not well, it knocked us all sideways. Um, and the film went very well in elsewhere in Europe. Um, but uh, it was it was their it was their um, patronizing view of a working class woman. Who is, um, you know, this should play the small parts, really. You know, should play the small parts. Know your place. Know your place. Yeah. Know yeah. your place. That's, that's what yeah. I mean. Yeah, know your place. Know your place. And um, no, it was, I, I just, I found that so revealing about the film industry. Because obviously, well, they just ignored her. And I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, n n not that you want, and, and she didn't notice, you know, she wasn't expecting anything. Um, but but on her behalf, I thought, well, that's that indicates the these people live in a bubble, you know, they're, they're not part of our world, they live in a bubble. Um, anyway, so if, if uh, it had to be one strong character, it'd be Chrissy Rock. Fabulous, thank you very much. Yeah, do, do, you know, do you know what, Ken? I think. There's one thing, whatever work you've ever done, whatever work you do in the future, there's there's one thing that shines through, I think, and that's that you care. Oh, and I think when you meet somebody who cares, it doesn't matter what they've done, whatever, it's about you as a person, and it comes across in bucket loads how much you actually care about other people. Yeah. And nobody in the world can buy that. You've either got it or you haven't, and you've got it in spades. Oh, you, it's been a pleasure to listen to you. Whatever you've said, the one thing that come across to me all the time was how much you actually cared about humans and about people. So look, it's been absolutely fantastic listening to you. Absolutely brilliant. Could listen to you all night, but I know James has <laughs> got to go to work. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute. Oh, very good. Oh, thanks. It's been great to talk to you. And you've been very kind to, and patient to to listen. Um, 
um, for so long. And and uh, I hope the um, well, I hope Everton don't go down. I'm pleased they they got at least some of the points back. And um, if, if you have to move ground, which is a pity, because uh, it is a pity. Um, yeah. It's a, I mean the end of the Gladys Street Road, and and it's yeah. um, I mean that that's one of the great locations, isn't it, for football? Yeah. Um, but um, anyway, um, if, if you g- g- give my well, um, I mean, as they say, I support both teams. Um, the uh, the first team in the reserves. So there you go. That's the That's anyway, the good, good it's to been an honour. Thank you. Uh, it's you been are a privilege to be to. Yeah, and I say the uh, 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 a great a great travel. To, well, it's, it's really nice to meet everyone. But football in here is a special and and. Yeah, I'm certainly talking to one here. So thanks for that. Thank you, Ken. James, do you want to wrap it up? Of course, yes. So, well, thank okay. you so much to everyone who's joined us today. Thank you to Dave Feely. Thank you to Neville Southall, who brought us all together. And thank you especially to Ken Loach, who's given us this time given us this time today. It's been an absolute... We'll see you at the next episode of the podcast. And to everyone out there, thank you for listening. We look forward to seeing you again. Bye.